Você encontra canecas térmicas, adesivos e camisetas estampadas da sua distribuição Linux favorita e muito mais na Dio Store. Acesse www.dilstore.com.br Fala cambada, beleza? Olha eu aqui, travês. E hoje eu trago mais integrante da equipe Endless, que seria um desenvolvedor do Endless OS. Então essa é minha primeira entrevista em inglês. Ah, moleque! Seguinte, então tá bom, eu vou falar em inglês, já que ele está falando em inglês comigo, tá bom? So, thank you for accepting my invitation. Could you introduce yourself first? My name is Jonathan Blanford and uh, I'm VP of Engineering here at Endless. Tell us a little more about the Endless OS and its differential. So Endless OS, how is it different? Um, I think Endless OS is a different operating system from a more traditional Linux distribution. Um, we've very much taken a step back and thought hard about the problem we're trying to solve. And that problem is that uh, for a large chunk of the world's population, computers are inaccessible, too expensive, and the wrong solution or if they're the right solution, they're not designed with them in mind. Um, so if you get outside sort of the developed world into a lot of the up-and-coming developing places, um, computers are, or certainly personal computers, are, are less prevalent and there are very good, big reasons for it. So I'm very much targeted and written to run on cheap hardware. That's a big design goal of ours, is to make sure that we can drive the price of computing down. Um, we care very much about making sure we have a very simple solution. I think Linux for too long has been, and I say this as someone who absolutely uh, loves working on Linux, Linux for too long has been something that is too complex and too hard to use, um, and something that is not really designed systemically to be easy to use. So we've taken the time to really try and simplify the user experience for people who have not been exposed to a lot of computers, or if they have, it's been in the form of a smartphone or a tablet or um, you know, a very old Windows-style PC at best. Um, and I think that a lot of, you know, Windows 8, Windows 10, and uh, new Mac OS versions are very Baroque and uh, hard for people who, who are just getting started and don't have a high degree of um, computer exposure to use. Um, it, it's hard for them to use, and we've really tried to fix that. And then finally, uh, in a lot of the world, the internet is really uh, a scarce commodity. It's either very expensive, there's not a lot of bandwidth to those areas, or um, it, it's just not available. And we've tried to make sure that as we design the operating system, we do it with uh, that in mind. So we try to make sure it works if you have the internet ena enabled or if you don't have the internet enabled. Is it easy for someone to install new programs or endless OS? If so, how can one do that? So the question was, is it easy to install applications on Endless OS, and if so, how does one do it? Um, so I'm going to give two answers to that. On one sense, it's very easy to install applications. Um, we have an app center on the desktop. You just uh, press a button and it pops up and asks you what you want to install. We think we've made it very attractive and easy to use. Um, we're actually switching to um, a modified version of GNOME software, also designed with that in mind. For the next version, it's just front and center, you press a button and there you go. Um, on the other hand, it's, it's very different from other, operating, uh, other Linux distros too because we don't have some of the more traditional tools like uh, DNF or apt or any of the other repositories available and instead we just have the endless supplied applications. Um, we make them available so you can have them on your machine offline, but nevertheless, it's not an open ecosystem. Um, so ad to address that, um, we've actually been moving over to use Flatpak as the way we distribute applications for the system. And Flatpak is a new standard um, that we're very excited about at Endless that can be used to make third-party applications and distribute them and uh, sandbox them and put them in a, a secure environment so that users can just install them. And this is something that's coming up in our next version and something that uh, we're, we're, you know, we're hoping to see the wider Linux community adopt uh, wholeheartedly. Which license did the Endless OS team um, choose to release Endless OS? So what licenses did the Endless team use to release Endless OS? 
Um, for the most part, the majority of the operating system builds on and extends the work of the open source community. Um, what we do is uh, we try to work within the upstream communities that we're part of. In fact, uh, in a lot of the engineers at Endless have very long histories within those communities, be it the kernel, be it the, uh, um, you know, the various desktops or X or whatever it happens to be. Um, and uh, w when we are working as building the majority of the operating system, we just adopt the, the license that the upstream community does and try and send our patches upstream and be good uh, Linux citizens. For the software that we write ourselves, for the most part we use free software licenses there are times that we have to um, use other things just from a, a pure pragmatics uh, perspective, um, but our, our goal is to choose an appropriate license, either you know LGPL or GPL or what, whatever it happens to be uh, based on what the app tends to be. But our, our default uh, for, for, for the majority of the software we write is to be open. I was talking about the system through the slash Etsy slash OS release and through the slash Etsy slash Debian version files and also through the LSB release command. I also checked the kernel version and I have to admit that it's hard to identify which distribution it's based on. Could you tell us if it's a distribution based or a Linux distribution? made from scratch. So the question is, what is the operating system that we're based on under the hood? Um, uh, I suppose deep down inside, we use Debian as the, the core of our base. Um, but from my perspective, that's not actually an interesting answer because the way we've approached making a distribution is very different from how Debian or normal Debian distributions work. Um, and that's because we've taken a very different approach to how we distribute the operating system. Um, so let me explain what I mean by that. Um, we do use sort of Debian and uh, those packages to assemble the operating system. We also use a bunch of upstream uh, packages directly. We also you know, use patches from other sources as well and assemble the operating system. But we don't distribute them in a form where you can have Debian files locally. Um, we don't use apt on the system, for example. What we use is we use something called OS tree uh, in order to distribute the operating system. And we distribute it as one big image. Uh, it's about two and a half gigs in size, but that's the core operating system is it's one image. What's OS tree? OS tree came out of uh, um, the GNOME project for their continuous integration effort, but what it is, is that you can think of it like Git for operating systems. It's really quite a neat technology. Um, what it does is it gives you a way to both um, distribute and um, ba basically distribute the operating system as one big uh, almost checkout, and you can go from version to version to version to version, like Git fairly atomically, or atomically, so you can go from you know, version 2.6.1 of EOS to version 2.6.2 of EOS to version 2.6.3 of EOS totally atomically so that the user just has to reboot to end up in the new version. And w what does this get us by not having packages, by having this one image? Well, it solves actually some real problems um, for our users that uh, I think Linux has struggled with for a long time. Um, first, I think that the normal distros have struggled to um, uh, y y there's some level of complexity and there's too, almost a paradox of choices, too many choices for end users when they have a lot of packages available. What a lot of people really want is they want a computer, they want it to work, and they just want to get their stuff done. Um, and by doing this OS tree based model, we're able to really as a company editorialize and find one solution that works. It means that there aren't a lot of different options, it means that the help uh, documentation can be written for one thing in mind. It's not, do you have this desktop? Do you have that desktop? Do you have these packages installed or anything like that? It's very much, let's get one sort of solution that works in our environment and not stray from that so that we can make a bunch of assumptions and, and provide a consistent experience and not have all these edge cases, edge cases that t historically have broken down. The second thing it really lets us do is it lets us um, 
uh, really test the heck out of one confirmation um, and make sure that it's rock solid stable and doesn't crash and works well together and doesn't have a whole bunch of combinatorial things that people haven't looked at. So when you have a bunch of packages, what you find is sometimes the default install is well tested, but the moment you start adding things, at least traditionally in Linux, um, you, you start adding some packages and you get up in a weird situation and things would just turn flaky over time. And by really trying to go for this one image, we end up in a situation where um, we have a much better tested and a much more stable operating system uh, that functions as a whole operating system. It's, it's a comprehensive whole. It's just not a bunch of packages that are mixed and matched and diced. Um, which leads me to uh, my third point, which is how does the user install applications if we don't have packages and we don't have apt. Um, we've taken sort of a neat approach to that is that we use a upst an upstream technology called Flatpak. It, it used to be called XDG app. It came out of the free desktop group. XDG stands for free desktop or cross desktop group. Um, and it, it started, um, it's got a long history. Uh, it sort of started out of the GNOME project, but it's been adopted by a number of, of people. Um, you see GNOME, you see KDE, you see LibreOffice, and, and other projects start to produce Flatpak uh, versions of their software. And Flatpak solves a lot of problems, um, sort of technologically, towards distributing apps in a open and a, a cross-distro way. So you're not worried about packages. Does this work on Ubuntu? Does it not work on Fedora? Which version of Ubuntu? Is it an old one? Is it Debian? Right. That's the kind of thing that has really stymied and held back Linux from developing a, a thriving and a true uh, um, third-party ecosystem. And we would like at Endless to see there be a wider uh, third-party ecosystem. And we use that sort of as the, the primary mechanism to distribute applications on the system. Um, taking a step back, this sort of model with a core image at the base with a bunch of applications on the end uh, that's very similar to what you see for cell phones, where you have a cell phone image plus applications installed on it. And I think it works very well for consumers in that environment. It's totally inappropriate for a web server, maybe. Um, but it's not what we're looking to do here. We're looking to try and make something that's really uh, useful for consumers. And, um, you know, I'm changing my mind on the web server portion because you see this model showing up uh, in things like CoreOS and Docker and that approach, and then also, you know, Project Atomic of Red Hat and, uh, uh, y you know, Docker as well. That kind of model is, is really proving itself on the server front, and uh, we're, we're trying to take it into the Linux desktop space. Thinking about being open, do you consider some features should be closed since they are the differential of the operating system, and since they are already free, when I say free, I mean available to use. The question is about whether or not we want to keep things closed or open or uh, what we are, what, what should be open. Um, so I, I think my perspective here is, is twofold. One, I've been doing free software for, you know, over 20 years now. It's very much core to what I've been trying to do and a lot of the engineers here feel very strongly that the free software community is a community and it's something that we are part of and we very much want to see um, uh, be successful and uh, for the vast majority of what we're doing, uh, we work with free software, it's what our, our cultural background is and it's, it's what we're producing and, and uh, it's, impo it's an important part of the world I think that um, we've lost sight of that a little bit along the way, um, is how important free software really is uh, from an ecosystem perspective. From an endless perspective, we're a new startup, so we're definitely trying to figure out what our business model is going to look like and how this is going to go. A lot of other you know, great distros like Red Hat, like Ubuntu, started with a bunch of mixed uh, source in order to get the market power that they had in order to go truly free. Um, and if there's a model that works for us in that space, I really hope we can find it. Um, and we are very much exploring that um, across what we're doing um, because that is so, so important. Um, that being said, not every, we don't open up everything that we, we do do. 
Um, some of it is just practicalities of it. There's a lot of things behind the scenes to make an operating system uh, that, that are very endless specific and, and internally focused. Um, but this is an area that we're absolutely trying to go as open as we can throughout uh, the operating system and everything we do. E eu espero que vocês tenham aprendido mais sobre o Endless OS. E eu agradeço a equipe Endless por ter aceitado participar muito aqui e contribuído bastante no meu canal. É isso aí galera, um abraço e falou!